This is the GMAT 41. You are welcome to our basic and organic chemistry class. In this class, we introduce the topic development of atomic theory. We are going to consider how atomic theory was developed. Who was responsible for that? We are also going to look at various scientists that discovered the protons, the neutrons, the electrons. We are going to also study how the charge to mass ratio was measured. In the course of this topic, we will also look at how we can calculate the speed, the velocity of an electron in a given field, be it magnetic or electric field. To start with, we look at John Dalton's atomic theory. In 1808, John Dalton proposed the first experimentally based theory of atomic structure. He later became known as the father of atomic theory, even if some of his theories have been modified. Quickly, we have five of the John Dalton's atomic theory. On the board here, we're going to consider them. And we're also going to look at those that have been modified and why they were actually modified. We have them on the board. Number one, all elements are made up of small indivisible particles called atoms. Yes, it is true. All elements, they are made up of atoms. However, the discovery of subatomic particles as well as atomic particles, you know, like protons, neutrons, electrons, they are atomic particles. We talk about the subatomic particles where we look into uh, things like the cleaners, the, the neutrinos, the positron, the quarks, you know, we consider that at the outset of this course, remember that. So the discovery of these atomic particles and then subatomic particles shows that, yes, all elements contain atoms, no argument, but this atom likely could not be the smallest particle of an element. Let's look at the second theory. Atoms can neither be created nor destroyed. Now you take note that I start this first one, this second one, I also start, and even the third one. Those ones start are the theories that have undergone modification. Atoms can neither be created nor destroyed. This is true under ordinary chemical reaction. When you move over into nuclear reaction, radioactive reaction, it has been proven that atoms can be created and can also be destroyed. Let us quickly consider a situation where you make aluminium 27, which is not radioactive, but through artificial radioactivity, by bombarding it with an energetic particle, it can produce another atom. Quickly, let us look at it. Aluminium 27, 27, that is atomic number 13, aluminium. If you bombard it with neutron, neutron, what are you going to get? During the bombardment, aluminium will emit alpha particle. And of course, we know that alpha particle is helium atom. So we're going to have 4, 2, which is helium atom. Now, let us assume we do not know the um, new atom that is being produced. We don't know. So let the mass number be A, and then the atomic number be Z. We can actually balance out the mass numbers and the atomic numbers so as to be able to identify X. Now on the reactant side, the mass numbers are 27 plus 1. If you add 27 plus 1, you'll get what? 28. Now you'll notice that if I have 28 on the left-hand side, that will be equal to, this arrow represents equal to, and then the mass number on the right-hand side is 4 plus A. You would see that the value of A will be 28 minus... 28 minus 4, which will give us 24. Okay, let us see what the atomic number is going to give to us. On the reactant side, 13 plus 0 also will give us 13 equal to, on the product side, you have 2 plus Z. You notice that Z will be equal to 13 minus 2, giving us what? 11. So if we have Z atomic number to be 11, which atom do you think X is? Atomic number 11, our first 20 element, is actually sodium, is that not so? So what have we learned from here? We've learned that the bombardment of aluminium with an energetic particle neutron produces a new atom, sodium. In fact, this is Zx, that atom, Zx, that atom is equal to 24, 11 sodium. This sodium is isotopic sodium. Is that okay? That is an isotope of sodium, sodium 24. So what have we just learned here in the second uh, in the second theory? 
atoms cannot be destroyed or created. Under a, a, a nuclear reaction, this has been modified. It shows that we can actually create an atom, can actually also destroy an atom. All right. Atoms of the same element are alike in every aspect but differs from atoms of all other elements. Once again, you see that this number three has been starred, showing that this theory has been modified. The discovery of uh, isotopes. The discovery of isotopes shows that atoms of the same element, in a way, may not be alike in all aspects, like the Dalton proposed. Is that okay? Uh, we remember when we treated isotopes, we stated that isotopes of an element they have the same chemical properties, but what are their physical properties? Their physical properties are different. Their physical properties are different. And so it shows that uh, it's not actually true that in all aspects, atoms of the same element will be the same. Alright, now, number four, when atoms combine with other atoms, they do so in simple ratio. Of course, that's true. Consider the formation of water. The ratio of combination of hydrogen to oxygen is 2 is to what? 1. Is that okay? Simple whole number ratios. Then number 5, all chemical changes result from combination or separation of what? Atoms. During chemical combination, we're going to find out when electrons combine or are being separated, it leads to chemical what? Changes. In the next video, we're going to consider scientists that discovered studied atomic particles. And that is what we are going to look at next. In this video, we now want to look at the discovery of electrons and protons. We want to find out the scientists that discovered electrons and protons. And of course, as much as possible, how he went about it. The scientist who discovered the electrons and the protons is J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson in 18... 97 carried out his cathode ray experiment using a discharge tube. Of course, he found out that when you subject a gas in that discharge tube under a high potential difference of about 10,000 volts, but under a low pressure, the pressure less than 10 millimeter of mercury, but of course, not as low as up to 0.01 millimeter of mercury, it shouldn't be up to that. But it's less than 10 millimeters of mercury. When this condition is attained, that the gas will begin to glow, to emit rays, you know. And when the rays are being emitted, are being produced, these rays will travel from the cathode to the anode. You can see the diagram here. This is just a simple discharge tube. Is that okay? Air is being evacuated. You know, air serves as an insulator. Is that okay? So it's being evacuated from the glass tube. So that we have only gas in that tube. You can see this space, a connection to a vacuum tube, a pump that helps to remove air from the discharge tube. Now, once that gas is subjected to this high potential difference and low pressure, that gas would begin to emit rays. Now, when the rays travel from cathode to anode, they hit the glass walls of the discharge tube, and that causes the discharge tube to glow. Right, you see light. Now, I'm going to quickly use uh, this fluorescence tube as an example to help us understand this idea. I don't know if you've watched the way the fluorescence tube produces light. You notice that once there is something like a battery connected to one end, once there is light, high potential difference and low pressure, you will notice a glowing emission of rays from one end of the fluorescence tube. First of all, like a red light, you know, and then the next thing you would notice. Along the length of the fluorescence tube, the light will now do what? Travel. That's how fluorescence tube brings light. You know that it does not bring light like a filament bulb. Normal yellow bulb, once there is light, just flash up immediately. That's not the way fluorescence tube operate. Fluorescence tube usually contains sodium uh, a powder, all right? So under that high uh, uh, potential difference and low pressure, the powder is being vaporized. Is that okay? It's being vaporized and it leads to the, the, the movement of these rays. We call them cathode rays because they actually emanate from the cathode that is a negative end and then travel towards to the anode. So you see, what helps us to see this light produced is as a result of these rays hitting the walls of the glass tube. For example, the walls of the fluorescence tube in this case. So that is actually how the uh, discharge tube operates. 
and there, as these cathode rays move, when subjected to either electric or magnetic field, the way they are being deflected shows that they are negatively charged. For example, the positive end of an electric field will attract these rays, will bend these rays towards itself. And because you have this positive charge of the electric field attracting the rays to itself, it simply means that the cathode rays are negatively charged. You know the laws of attraction, is that not so? The law of attraction, unlike charges, attract. So if you talk about positive attracting these cathode rays, it simply means that the cathode rays must be negatively charged. Even magnetic field also does that. And the north pole of magnetic field that serves positive attracts these cathode rays to itself. Now, I want to look at the properties of cathode rays. We have five of them on board here. Cathode rays, they travel in straight lines. Number two, they are negatively charged particles which are being deflected both by electric and magnetic field. They produce X-ray when they strike a metallic object. They also possess ki a kinetic energy which shows that they are actually material objects. The fluorides, that is glow, bring out light when they strike the glass wall of a discharge tube. What is of interest to us here is to know who actually discovered the electrons, and it's J.J. Thompson. He also carried out an experiment to discover the protons as well, to using this discharge tube. But in that case, the cathode is a perforated cathode. Is that okay? It's a perforated cathode. And then he discovered that there are reddish glow of light, you know, of rays of light that moves in opposite direction to the direction in which the cathode rays look. Like looking at this tube, if the cathode ray is going this way, in his second experiment, using this same discharge tube, but this time around perforated was cathode, he discovered that there were some rays that were moving in opposite direction to the way these cathode rays move, which means those rays, they are moving in this other way. Is that okay? Against the direction of the cathode rays. I said, for this to happen, it therefore means that these are actually positive words charges. Because if we have negative charges moving, for example, from cathode to anode, there should be an equal number of charges that can counterbalance these rays in order to make an atom electrically word neutral. That was his argument, which helped him to discover the protons. So, who discovered electrons and protons? J.J. Thompson using the discharge tube and in order to make the gas to glow what happens subjects the gas to a high potential difference and what a low pressure very importantly too the properties of cathode ray you should know them in the next video we're going to see who actually measured the charge to mass ratio and who actually measured the charge of an electron to be 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 columns. In this video, we now want to find out the scientists that measured the charge to mass ratio of an atom and the scientists that measured the charge of an electron using the modified cathode ray tube. J.J. Thompson measured the charge to mass ratio of an atom. Using this modified cathode ray tube, the value of the charge to mass ratio as measured by J.J. Thompson was given as 1.76 times 10 raised to the power 11 column per kilogram. Now, who measured the charge of an electron to be 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 column? R. A. Millikan in 1910 using his oil drop experiment. He measured the magnitude of the charge of an electron to be equal to 1.6 times 10 raised to the minus 9 in college. The negative sign here is simply to tell us that we are talking about electrons. Is that okay? That's just the only reason we introduced negative sign there. The magnitude of the charge itself is 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 column. Now, if we already know the value of the charge to mass ratio as given by J.J. Thompson to be 1.76 times 10 raised to the power 11 column per kilogram, and we know the charge, the value of the charge 
of an electron to be 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 coulomb as given by R.A. Millikan. We can actually calculate the mass of an electron. Yes, we can actually calculate that. Take care of something. We know E all over M already to be equal to 1.76 times 10 raised to the power 11. That will simply mean that our mass will now be equal to E divided by what? 1.76 times 10 raised to the power 11. That is to get the mass of the electron. And of course, the charge which we use E to represent, we know the value already. So just imagine we can calculate the mass of an electron to now be equal to the charge is 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19. Is that okay? Then divide by what? The value of the charge to mass ratio there, which is 1.76 times 10 raised to the power 11. If you press this using your calculator, solving it out, you get a mass of an electron to be equal to 9.1 times 10 raised to the power minus 31 kilogram. Now that we've known the scientists that measured the mass to charge ratio, which is J.T. Thompson, we've also known that R.A. Millikan measured the charge of an electron. We've also determined the mass of an electron. We don't want to explain these modified cathode ray tube. What's our focus here? We want to know the function of some of the things we have there, like the perforated anode, the slit, the field used there, which of course could be magnetic or electric, but I'll talk more in terms of magnetic field. And then we'll talk about the screen. The screen here is zinc sulfide. What are their functions? So here we go. When we subject the gas used here for the experiment under a high voltage and low pressure, of course we know that the gas will vaporize and begin to emit rays. The rays are called cathode rays. We explained that already in the previous video. Now what will this anode do? The anode will help to attract these cathode rays. And because the anode is what? Perforated. It will not allow this cathode ray to do what? Pass through it. Once the cathode rays pass through this perforated anode, they approach the slit. What's the function of the slit? The slit helps to direct the cathode rays in what? Straight line. So they keep and maintain the cathode rays moving in a straight line. Therefore, this cathode rays is meant to pass through the slit in a straight line and then hit this fluorescent screen, zinc sulfide. The purpose of this zinc sulfide you know, zinc sulfide is a substance that can actually cause fluorescence. It, it, can, it can help us to delineate a spot, delineate to indicate. It can help us to see that, oh, something is actually coming to this point. And these cathode rays would produce bright spots at point A. So the zinc sulfide helps us to see it. Once the cathode ray hits it, it will start to fluoresce. That's why we refer to it as a fluorescent word screen. The field that is used in this modified cathode ray, what does it do? It has to deflect these cathode rays from the straight part. And deflecting them, it gives it a circular path. You can see it, which is why we have another point produced at point what B. There's another bright spot at point B. It's as if the bright spot at point A has been shifted toward point B due to the application of what? The field. Of course, that is as a result of attraction. When cathode rays we know to be negatively charged, if you introduce a positive field, the positive field will attract those cathode rays, bend them away from their straightforward path. Now, when there is a bending, what do we expect? We talk about radius, is that not so? Because there is a bend in the circular path, we talk about what? Radius. And whenever there is a circular path motion, the concept of centripetal force comes into what? Play. It's possible for us to still return this bright spot at point B back to where it's supposed to be at point A. Still introducing what? A field that will be the same as this negative charge cathode ray. So that there will be repulsion. Is that okay? That negative field will now push this bright spot back to point A. So we've known the functions of the things used in this modified cathode ray tube. In our next video, we are going to derive the velocity of the electrons in this modified cathode ray in this field. We'll determine the velocity of that electron. We'll also determine the field strength, be it electric or magnetic field strength. Because in this field, there are three 
force is acting there. We have the magnetic force, the electric force, the centripetal force. So we're going to use these three forces to derive the necessary equations for calculation in our next video. We now want to derive the velocity of an electron that is emanating from the cathode towards what? The anode, just like we explained from previous video. How do we determine the velocity of an electron? We shall link this to the charge to mass ratio. Recognizing that for an electron moving from cathode to anode, it's subject to three forces. One, the centrifugal force. You know, as explained in the previous video, when the cathode rays that produce bright spot at point A are being deflected by the magnetic field to point B, there is something to move in a circular path. You need centripetal force to keep that in a circular path. However, centrifugal force is required to push it backward. Is that okay? To that point A. Now there is this balancing of forces. Of course, we know that centripetal force is equal to centrifugal force. The only difference is that centripetal force pulls the object moving in a circular path towards the center of the circle, while centrifugal force pushes the object away from the center of the circle. So in this case, specifically, please note that it is centrifugal force that acts on the electron as the electron is being deflected towards the circular path. Centrifugal force. Now we also have the electric force as well as what? Magnetic force that acts on these electrons. Now for these electrons to maintain a straight path, these three forces must balance. And if they must balance, what does it mean? It means that we expect that centrif uh, centrifugal force, which I'm using Fc for it, will be equal to magnetic force, which I'm using Fb. It will also be equal to electric force, which I'm using what? Fe. Centrifugal force is equal to mv squared divided by r. It has the same formula as centripetal force. Remember I told you these two forces balance already for any object moving in a circular path. The study of motion in physics tells more about that. We also know from the study of magnetic field that the magnetic force is equal to the magnetic field strength, also known as magnetic induction, capital letter B, times the charge, times the velocity of the electron moving in the magnetic field. We usually see the formula as QVB. Q, as possibly may be seen in some text, is equal to what? E here, because it's defining charge. Then V for velocity B, the magnetic field strength. We also know from the study of electric field that the electric force is equal to the electric field strength, capital letter E, times what? The charge. We usually have it as F equal to QE. Remember that Q, we are using E to represent it. That QE, that E that is capital letter E, the electric word field strength. So please take notes. Q, as you may have known in all these formulas before now, possibly, is equal to what? E here based on what I chose to use. Now, if these three forces balance, if the balance is not mean that we're going to have something like this. Where this is centrifugal force being equal to magnetic force being equal to electric watt force. Now, what I want to do is, at every point in time, picking two of each of the forces, equating them and then solving to get something of interest. First, the charge to mass ratio. If I equate the centrifugal force to magnetic force, I'll get something like this. Is that okay? mv squared all over r equal to b e v. Now, if you take me, you can divide through by velocity. This velocity will cancel one of these velocity from here. So we'll have mv. mv will now be all over r being equal to what? b e. Now, if you divide through by the mass of the electron, on the right hand side we'll have charge, which is e, divided by what? The mass of the electron, which is m. That will move this b to come down as denominator. Therefore, giving us that the charge to mass ratio is equal to the velocity to be left here because we've already moved n to come under here as denominator and you moved b to come under here as denominator. So, charge over mass ratio will now be equal to velocity of the electron divided by the magnetic field strength b times the radius of the circular path that the electron is trying to take. Now, that gives us this equation four star. So, take note for calculation purposes, you can actually get Velocity from here, we can get the radius of the circular path from here, we can get the magnetic field strength from here. We can also get the charge to mass ratio if we know the velocity and magnetic field strength as well as radius. 
You know, given an equation, you can calculate any of the quantities from there by making it subject of the word formula. Now, let us move on to a case where we equate the centrifugal force to electric force. When we equate that, we're going to get this. Now, there is no common term there, so nothing can cancel out. Now, all I need to do is to divide through by what? Mass. Just like I did there. If I divide through by mass, because you know I'll have mv squared divided by mass. They have R here already equal to the electric field strength times charge divided by what? Mass. This mass and mass will go off. Then, to make E over N subject of the formula, you know that this capital letter E will come over here. This small letter E is charged. Capital letter E will be removed. So that we're going to have V squared all over this electric field strength. will now come to become a multiplier of this radius and that will be equal to charge over what? Mass. That's how we got this equation 5 star. Then again, let us now equate magnetic force towards electric force and see what we're going to get. So look at it. Magnetic force BEV equal to what? Electric force, which is capital letter E, electric field strength times the charge, small letter E. Now, our aim is to get the velocity of the electron from here. Take note that the charge is common to both sides of the equation, so that charge will cancel out. You can see that. Small letter E, small letter E will cancel out. Then make V subject to the formula you divide through by the magnetic field strength B. And that gives us equation 6 star to be the formula we can use to calculate velocity if we know the electric field strength and the magnetic field strength. So you can see that the velocity of the electron is simply the ratio of the electric field strength E towards the magnetic field strength B. Conclusively, let us see another formula for the charge to mass ratio. Watch something here. Already from equation 4 star, we know charge to mass ratio to be equal to velocity divided by magnetic field strength times the radius. We now know velocity to be equal to electric field strength divided by magnetic field strength. So in this equation, first star, if I fix in E over B, that is electric field strength divided by magnetic field strength here, I will have E as numerator. It's going to be something like this. Why do I work in that? All right, so it's going to be something like uh, charge over mass ratio being equal to, in place of this V, I will put E over B. Then everything will be divided by what? BR. BR. Now, mathematically, this B will step down to the denominator to multiply this B. And that will give us B squared. So you have only electric field strength in the numerator. Therefore, the charge to mass ratio can also be obtained as electric field strength divided by the radius of the circular part times the square of the magnetic field strength. Now, we have the definition of each of the terms used in these equations. In the next video, we shall now focus on the scientists that discovered the nucleus as well as the neutrons. In this video, let us now consider the discovery of the nucleus of an atom as well as the neutron. Who discovered them? Now, we're going to start with the nucleus of an atom. In the year 1911, Ernest Rutherford announced his result of alpha particle scattering experiment from which he concluded that an atom consists of a core and the core is known as the nucleus of an atom. So you see that Rutherford discovered the nucleus. However, there is something I'd like you to know regarding the alpha particle scattering experiment. Why this glory and honor have been given to Rutherford, it's important for us to know that two other scientists were connected to the experiment specifically. Hans Geiger, who happened to be a colleague to Ernest Rutherford, and then Ernest Marsden. Marsden at the time was the student of Ernest Rutherford. And in fact, he was given the project work of this alpha particle scattering experiment. And then he measured these angles through which these alpha particles were scattered. It was after which Hans Geiger reported to Rutherford that actually they've seen some alpha particles bouncing back to the source from which it was projected. On the board here, we have the diagram showing the alpha particle scattering experiment. This is the source of the alpha particle. It has been shielded by lead block, you know. Alpha particle is, uh, is radioactive, so it needs to be shielded by lead block. Lead block shields them. Is that okay? Because being radioactive, you know, it can be dangerous to the health. And now we have metal foil here. The metal used in the experiment is gold foil. Is that okay? Now, notice that 
We have some beam of undeflected alpha particle. These are the beams of alpha particle. Some of them pass through the gold foil without being deflected. You can see them. There were others that passed through and then were deflected. Look at the line there. Look at them. This is a microscope attached to a screen. The screen is zinc sulfide in order to detect the deflected alpha particles. Why do we some that merely bounce back to the source? You can see this one being hit back from where it was directed from. So Rutherford explained the result that the only thing that is responsible for the bouncing back of some of this alpha particle is because there is something in the core, in the middle of an atom, is that okay, that likely may have the same mass as what was projected to it. And so there is this collision and bouncing back. He referred to the core, like I mentioned earlier, as the nucleus of an atom. Do not forget, Rutherford discovered a nucleus. He is giving the glory of the alpha particle scattering experiment. However, should you be asked if there are other scientists connected to this experiment, the answer is yes. We have Hans Geiger and Ernest Masden connected to the experiment. Let us now talk about the discovery of the neutron. In 1932, Chadwick, from his experiment of bombarding beryllium with alpha particle, discovered the neutron. He stated that a neutron has the same mass as a proton, but a neutron does not carry any charge. We don't want to look at the properties of the fundamental component of the atom, protons, electrons, and what? Neutrons. We're going to classify these properties under relative charge, their absolute charge, their relative amounts in the unit of atomic mass units. We're also going to consider their absolute charge in the unit, that's absolute mass rather in the unit of what? Grams. So here we go. The first we consider the relative charge of this component. Proton has a charge of plus one, electron minus one, and then neutron is zero, it has no charge. What about the absolute charge? Proton, the absolute charge of proton is 1.602 times 10 to minus 19. It is equal to the absolute charge of electrons. The only difference is that the electron carries minus, white proton we assign plus to raise. that okay? So you can see electron, electron is minus 1.6, I approximated 1.6 here, to tell you that you can choose to use 1.6, you can also choose to use 1.602. For calculation purposes, most time we use 1.6 times 10 from minus 19 colleague. What is the absolute charge of neutron? It's zero. It simply does not have any charge. Relative amount of these components in the unit of atomic mass units, the proton is 1.00727. The electron is 0.000549. Now look at the neutron, 1.00866. Did you take note that approximately a whole number, if you approximate a whole number, the relative amount of proton is equal to the relative amount of neutron. If you approximate a whole number, you'll be getting one one there. Is that not so? Which agrees with the fact that neutron has the same mass as what? As protons. Now the absolute mass in the unit of grams. Once again, proton is 1.6725 times 10 power minus 24 grams. Electron is 9.1094 times 10 power minus 28 grams. That of electron, we already encountered it when we discussed the charge to mass ratio. You remember that, right? Say so it is 9.1 times 10 power minus 31 there. That minus 31 is in gram, is in kilograms. In kilograms. In the gram value, it is minus 28. You know, to convert from grams to kilogram, you divide the gram by 1,000. If you divide this value 9.1094 times 10 to minus 28 grams by 1,000, you will get it to be times 10 to power minus 31 in kilogram. What about the absolute mass of neutron is 1.6749 times 10 to power minus 24 grams. Once again, approximately, if you notice that the absolute mass of protons and neutrons in gram are also what? Equal. In the next video, we are going to look at the atomic models as proposed by J.J. Thompson, by Rutherford, who also talked about the Nurse Bohr's atomic model.